Welcome to Behavior Grooves. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We are building a community of people interested in positively applying behavioral science to their work and life. We do this by having fun and engaging conversations with academics, practitioners, and accidental behavioral scientists. In this episode, we are continuing our series with Carnegie Mellon researchers and sharing a conversation we have with Professor Danny Oppenheimer. Danny has over 50 peer-reviewed publications, as well as a number of book chapters and media contributions. Among his notable works, he co-authored Democracy Despite Itself, Why a System That Shouldn't Work at All Works So Well, published by MIT, and Psychology, a Cartoon Introduction, a cartoon book published by W.W. W. Norton. Isn't that awesome? I know. <laughs> now, don't forget that he earned the Ig Nobel Prize. The Ig Nobel Prize. Yeah, the Ig Nobel Prize for a paper called Consequences of Erudite Vernacular Utilized Irrespective of Necessity, Problems with Using Long Words Needlessly. <laughs> what a great title. <laughs> That's an awesome title. We talked to Danny shortly after returning from a semester in London, and we found him engaging, and we jumped right into his work on how helicopter and submarine parenting styles correspond to their beliefs about governance. We also talked about Sesame Street and how mnemonics and music can help us learn. He's admitted that he's lived for long periods of time without a mobile phone and that he prefers listening to the radio for music rather than curating his own playlist. But his comments on helicopter parenting were particularly timely since the college admissions bribery scandal was brought to light shortly after our discussion was recorded. And we discussed some of the implications from that in our grooving session. Yeah, we also spent some time in our grooving session on the ways business leaders manage data inputs from various sources and the potential impacts on the business decisions. So sit back and enjoy another episode of our Carnegie Mellon series with Professor Danny Oppenheimer. Welcome, Danny Oppenheimer, to the Behavioral Grooves podcast. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. We are glad to have you here. We'd like to start with a quick speed round. All right. So would you like to live, would you prefer to live your life without a mobile phone or without a laptop? Uh, no mobile phone. In right. fact, I, I lived without a mobile phone for quite a while. Um, I, I don't use my phone very much. I'm sort of a Luddite, and so um, my phone breaks, and I don't fix it until uh, someone else forces me to, usually my wife or my parents. <laughs> That's a, okay. This yeah. is good. That has not been the, the normal answer for most of the people. Well, with my laptop, I work and write and such, but with my phone... Um, all I, you know, I, I, it, all it does is distract me because it goes off and prevents me from working and writing and other things. So, yeah, a bike or a unicycle, uh, a unicycle would be cooler, but I don't know how to ride one. So I'm going to have to say a bike. Okay. That's okay. Uh, would you prefer to win a Nobel prize or an Ig Nobel prize? At this point, a Nobel prize, I've already got an Ig Nobel prize. Oh, snap. <laughs> <laughs> sing in the shower or sing in front of your class. Both. Both. All right. Wow. There we go. Okay. If you had to choose one or the other, is would you have a preference? Could you identify a preference? I love singing in the shower. It's fun. I like the acoustics. I actually sound sort of good, but uh, singing in front of my class, I actually have to do for certain lectures. And so if I couldn't do that, it would actually undermine some of my lectures. And so I... Um, I would have to choose that one. All right. I'm okay. going to have to go down that rabbit hole. Why <laughs> do you need to sing in front of your class for some of the lectures? What What are the learning points that you're trying to, to convey there? So a lot of mnemonics uh, are uh, best involve music, I guess, is the best way to say it. And okay. so uh, there are times where I sing a little thing and it works very well. Um, so uh, there's this study that was done by... Um, Sesame Street. I, I don't actually know who did it. I would <laughs> Cookie just, Monster, it Big is, Bird. Okay, yes, it's, it's yes. Cookie Monster, and it's uh, trying to keep, teach kids delayed gratification. Um, and so there's Cookie Monster, and he's offered a cookie, and this is the old uh, marshmallow task, except yeah. done with cookies instead. Um, and they say, if you can wait, you get two cookies. And because he's Cookie Monster, he's struggling to wait. And they have these people come on and go, good things come to those who wait. Good things come to those who wait. And um, and then if he learns this, and then whenever he's trying to wait, he starts singing the song, which distracts him and helps him do this. And this is something that I can teach in my class. Um, but you can't do that without describing the, the song. The song. And it turns out that when children have seen this video, they 
are much better at the marshmallow task and that um, they actually will sometimes start singing the song spontaneously while they're trying to uh, prevent themselves from eating the marshmallow. So I should have had my, my kids watch this because as the, you know, bad psychologist father I am, I, I, I ran my own marshmallow no, test on didn't. my kids. Oh, God. One passed, one didn't. didn't. Skinner. That's all right. There Jeez. you go. <laughs> oh. uh, but anyway, Danny, tell us about some of the research that you're currently working on or finding exciting. What are some of the new things that you're, you're looking at? You have a wide breadth of research, but what's some of the newer stuff? So I'm doing a lot of things, and it's hard to choose, but I think I'm going to talk to you today about helicopter parenting, perhaps. Okay. Um, people seem to find that interesting. Yeah. Um, Why so, in the world would they find that interesting in, uh, in a day when it seems like if you're not a helicopter parent, you're bad? Uh, well, and if you are a helicopter parent, you're bad. You're bad. There's, there's no way to, to win, I think, someday. But um, this is actually not about whether it's good or bad to be a helicopter parent, but what the implications are for... Um, other types of thinking. And so let me, let me take a step back. Um, George Lakoff has a model of political thinking. And the basic notion is that uh, the way we think about government or politics or policy, it's an abstract concept. It's hard to wrap our minds around. So instead, we try to ground it in some sort of metaphor. And the metaphor that he proposed is that of family. And so when we're trying to think about government, which is abstract, and we don't know much about it, we think about it the way we think about family, which is concrete and we have experience with. Um, although family is also somewhat abstract, but at least we have experiences with it. Um, and he has this evidence that uh, one of the things that makes liberals and conservatives different is the way they think about parenting, uh, that the nurturant parent is uh, a person who tries to support their child and um, and be there and help and uh, versus a disciplinarian parent whose belief is that the child it needs to be kept in line. Um, and it's not clear if one of these is better than the other, but it is clear that this affects their political attitudes, um, or at least it's highly correlated with their political attitudes. Okay. Um, so people who have disciplinarian parenting styles, when you think about welfare, they say, well, if we give welfare, we're enabling the sorts of behaviors that led people to do this, so we have to discipline and keep people in line. Whereas nurturing parents, when they think about welfare policy, they think, oh, we need to help people achieve their potential, and we're giving them resources to do so. And the same is true of uh, criminal justice. One side thinks about we need to discipline, the other side thinks we need to reform. Mm -hmm. um, and Lakoff argues that uh, people have a view of what parenting should be, and then they apply that to government as well. Uh, and so I was listening to this sort of uh, theory, theorizing, and I, I realized that there's a new dimension of parenting that has become very prevalent recently, which is the notion of helicopter parenting uh, versus free-range parenting, they sometimes call it. I yeah, like to call free it- Free-range parenting? That's, the, the, uh, that's what the formal <laughs> thing is. I'd like to call it submarine parenting because then you've got the two vehicles and it's nice and contrasting. I like it. I it like hasn't that. caught on, but uh, you know, maybe, like maybe behavioral grooves will make that the new the phrase. submarine parenting there, style. There you go. But uh, we, to, to go with what normal people talk about, it's free, it's, uh, free range versus helicoptering. <laughs> and if we take Lakoff seriously, that the way we think about parenting affects the way we think about government, then um, as people become helicopter in their mindset, as they think that helicoptering is the right style of parenting, that should be reflected in their political attitudes as well. And so we started running some studies investigating this notion. Uh, and the way it would potentially reflect is in paternalism. So something along the lines of motorcycle helmet laws, where you're protecting the person from themselves, or soda laws, where you're not allowed to buy a certain amount of soda. Um, and the question really is, to what extent do people who endorse helicopter parenting also endorse uh, paternalistic policy? And we ran some studies looking at this. We created um, some scales that measure paternalistic attitudes towards government, and we okay. created some scales that measured helicopter parenting. Uh, not helicopter parenting on whether or not you do it, but whether or not you believe it's an appropriate style of parenting. And I can talk about that more if you're curious. But the, the long short is that um, the helicopter parenting scale was the single best predictor of uh, paternalistic government attitudes. It was better than party affiliation, than um, whether a person self-identified as conservative or liberal, any demographic things you might think of. Um, and we haven't been able to find anything that predicts quite as well as a helicopter parenting preference. Wow. 
How, uh, I mean, I think that that's fascinating. So let, let's just talk a little bit about the your, uh, deep dive a little deeper into the findings. Does it cross, do these cross party lines, liberal versus conservative affiliation, these these kinds of uh, mind sense or uh, self schemas, self identities, do these things yeah. cross? Yeah, so there are some, there, there may be slight, more, slightly more frequent in one party than the other, but these are not. It's not that liberals are uh, helicopter parents and conservatives are not or vice versa. Um, there are lots of people on both sides of the aisle who have this parenting style. And uh, it's interesting because if you think about paternalism, that's not really correlated with Democrat-Republican. There are issues which Democrats are paternalistic on and Republicans are paternalistic on. But um, it seems to be something that is driven by some construct that is not central to the party lines. You had yeah. talked about the appropriateness of helicopter parenting and people's perception on that. Uh -huh. You said, let's dig into that. So how do people come to that or what is it that that uh, they, they determine if it's appropriate or not an appropriate uh, kind of way? So I can't tell you why people feel that helicoptering is appropriate or not. I've never done any research on that. Uh, what we can do is measure the extent to which people do. Okay. Um, and the way we did this was we actually uh, interviewed a lot of people and said, what are behaviors that you would consider helicopter parents? What would you consider free range? We looked at websites, we looked at articles, and we just pulled out a, a huge number of possible behaviors. Um, and they range dramatically to things that most people would say that is ridiculous, uh, it's too helicoptery, to things that almost everybody would say that is too free rangey, that's scary. Okay. Um, and But what we see is that you get the entire range. There are people who are extremely helicoptery, most, some people who are extremely free range, and most people fall somewhere in the middle. Um, so we have some examples of uh, parents who would go to their college age kids dorm rooms and clean their bathrooms for them and uh, cook them dinner so that they would have that and not have to worry about it. Um, you get the stories about parents who call their college professors, uh, the, sorry, their students' college professors to ask about grades, to ask if the student can get an extension. So rather than having the student call and say, can I get an extension, a parent will call and say, can my child get an extension? Um, and some people say, oh, that's, that's totally cool. That's the way it's supposed to be. And most people would say, whoa, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, I'm in the whoa. Um, <laughs> well, but I've heard, the, I've heard, you know, people calling, parents calling after an interview, calling the, you know, job uh, employer, employer yeah. and saying, how, you know, why haven't you, you know, called back my son or daughter? Well, and, it actually, you get even worse than that. And another study we were doing where we were trying to manipulate parenting, uh, helicopter parenting attitudes. Uh, one way we did it was by looking at employment behavior. Um, and we got some real stories um, of I want to say absurd, although I try not to cast value <laughs> judgments on these, but let's say extreme okay. um, helicopter parenting examples that would lead people to say, to reject that and rebel against it and say, I don't want to be that. Uh, and they include like kids whose parents ask to sit in on the interviews to answer questions for them, or kids who uh, are Skyping with their parents the questions and then their parents are Skyping back the answers or at least texting. During the interview. During the interview, the interviewer will ask a question, the kid will text their parent, the parent will tell them what to say and they'll say it. Um, who, who related this? Was this the interviewer that related the story to you? No, or, the, or? if you go to like Reddit or um, oh, yeah. news reports, you can find stories of these things. And they're always sort of the incredulous, how could that possibly be? Yeah. Um, and so when we prime people with that, they actually become less helicoptery. They re react, this is not something I want to be. Uh -huh. um, interestingly, though, even though there's an incredibly strong correlation between helicopter parenting and political preference, um, when you manipulate helicopter parenting, that doesn't manipulate pol political preference. So we were unable to backdoor change people's political preferences through their helicopter preferences. Okay. So it, it so seems, what does that tell you? What, well, what it says is that, um, well, there could be <laughs> several things. Whenever you're dealing with two variables that are correlated, A could cause B, B could cause A, or there could be a third variable C. Yeah. Um, we think we've ruled out A causes B. We think we've ruled out B causes A, and that means there's a third variable C. That is yet undiscovered? That is what we are working on right now. Oh, so cool. when you say, you know, what are you working on in the lab right now? We are trying to solve that problem. Um, okay. Can we go back to the how you discover this? I, you, you started talking about doing interviews with lots of people, uh -huh. like talking to them. You do research. You're going to Reddit. Uh, you're Googling things, uh -huh. right? How did you, how did you uh, start to come up with a population that was large enough to 
and, and what were the kinds of questions that you decided to ask to right. try to understand what it was that made someone a helicopter parent or, or not? Yeah, so we went to uh, actually lots of undergrads first, and we just said, when you think of helicopter parenting, list three behaviors that you think are helicoptery. Uh, and we just collected this from 50 students, and we got a lot of answers. And we went online and looked up helicopter parenting and tried to glean from newspaper articles or Reddit or Twitter what people were saying. We ended up with a list of lots and lots of different behaviors. And then we went to a, a Mechanical Turk sample. Okay. It's an online sample. And we um, threw all of these things on, and we looked basically for statistical correlations between them. So we did basically factor analysis. It, it's a, a strategy that used to be used in um, personality psychology yep. um, when they were discovering the big five. The yep. reason they know there are five is because agreeableness and friendliness and helpfulness, all of them correlate really highly so you know that there are a few factors. So we were able to use um, large sampling and then statistical techniques to winnow down what were the best um, items, the ones that were the most predictive of the construct we were looking at. And we ended up with something like 20 questions. I don't know the exact number. Um, and they include things like, is it to what extent is it okay to um, write your child's uh, college essays for them? Uh, uh, to what extent is it okay to allow your kid to ride his bike to the park alone? Right. Uh, to what extent is it acceptable to... Um, there, you know, and then we also have questions about um, age. At what age is it appropriate to ask your kid to do their own laundry? At what age is it appropriate to ha um, have your kid have an allowance with no restrictions? And right. so we ask these sorts of questions that are all normed in advance, uh, and they they hang together quite well. So I want to make sure that we we get to the extreme of n the summerining parent, yes, right? Yeah. As we're now using that that term instead of free range, because you talked about the extreme on the helicopter. What were some of the extreme examples on the opposite side? So my favorite example um, was a person who grew up in Florida, and uh, apparently there was an alligator uh, who would occasionally uh, take residence in her swimming pool or, you know, the backyard swimming pool. And <laughs> this is a problem that we don't have in Minnesota. No, just FYI. <laughs> um, but this was a, and the, 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 the free rangey part was the kid. It wasn't just the kid was allowed to go swimming without supervision, which many people would say you should always supervise a kid. But the, how, the old, how old was the child young, yeah. but I don't know exactly the okay. age. Um, but the, the rule was you're allowed to go swimming unsupervised, but first you have to check to make sure there's no alligator in the pool. <laughs> because they're wow um and so that i felt was you know it, there was a restriction so oh. it wasn't just jump in the pool with the alligator but it, it was a wow. such a free range restriction that uh, most people would say no i think maybe if we know that there might be an alligator in the pool th that we maybe want to have a parent uh, might want to <laughs> there, there should maybe be a little bit more uh supervision under those circumstances but yes. you know <laughs> wow. Okay. Now that, I mean, this, look, these are extreme examples, right? right? You know, um, so this is not typical for those of, there are people who are trying to pass free range parenting laws now. And, you know, Utah just passed one um, so that parents who let their kid go to the park unsupervised don't get thrown in jail for yeah. child neglect. Uh, I don't, Nothing that I'm talking about with alligators in the pool should be taken as informative to those debates because it's so extreme. Um, but, you know, it, it is it was we didn't even include that one on our survey because it was just so that, so far yeah. out in wow. whatever field. I'm just reeling over that one. I'm yeah. sorry, but my brain is still just trying to process. How do you get to the point where you say, well, just, you know, Johnny, just make sure there's no alligator in the pool <laughs> well, before you go in. <laughs> The more common ones involve having their kids cook meals at like four years old or something where the kid is barely old enough and they're still in the stove trying to cook for themselves. Yeah. Um, so that's those are oh. other extreme ones. But they're, there's no alligators in those, so they're less fun to talk about. Yeah, it, they know. Is, is there any relationship to uh, between uh, what the parenting style is of, of the parent and what the kids – this is, might be completely unrelated, but, but how the kids grow up and do they tend to adopt or deny the parenting style that they've grown up with so in our samples we don't have any parent child teams so i yeah. don't know how a parent uh what a parent's attitude is affects the child i can imagine them just following along saying this is what's done i can also imagine they're rebelling um 
there is a lot of research on helicopter parenting and what it does to the children outside of their attitudes on helicopter parenting. It's not my research, and quite honestly, I don't know it very well. Perhaps I should because I do helicopter parenting <laughs> stuff, but I, I'm much more interested in what it means to be a helicopter parent than what the effects are down yeah. the stream. But since you asked, my understanding, limited as it is of the uh, literature, is that helicopter parenting has good short-term effects and very bad long-term effects. Yeah. So basically, if you do your kids' homework for them, the kids are going to get A's, and yeah. that will maybe help them get into college. But at some point, they're going to have to do their own homework, and they won't know how to do it because it's been done for them. And it also may have mental health consequences because they never learn to explore and be comfortable with you know failure. And so um, there, there are positive short-term benefits, but in the long-term, it may backfire. Yeah, you get into like, you know, Duckworth's grit and some of those components of, of, of all of that element. And I could see where that would definitely have an impact on, on some of those factors. So, yeah. so you were talking about the A doesn't cause B in this and B doesn't cause A or correlate, not cause, you know, yeah, looking, they, they, yeah. they definitely correlate, they correlate but they, 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 yeah, cause. Yeah. All right. But you're looking at C. So is there any, what, yeah. what are you trying, what, what are some of the hypotheses that you got going on? Can for, you share it, them with us? Well, I can. Um, they're not great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, well if so there's something what? better to talk about, talk about Well, that. so let me, let me, I will tell you one little piece of like suggestive evidence. Um, and this was brought about by um, what happened actually at Yale uh, a few years back okay. when uh, there was a professor who wrote it, uh, students about what Halloween costumes they could or could not wear. And um, the professor basically said, wear what you want. We're not going to police you. And there were protests all across campus that ended up with the professor having to resign their position as uh, head of a house. Um, and because the, the professor said, wear what you want, we're not going to police you. Basically, the students were upset because they felt um, I'm trying to represent their position fairly, but they they felt that they believe that, that they should they have a right to be in a safe environment, that they should feel safe. They shouldn't feel under threat, which and, implies there was a concern uh, 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 or an anticipated concern about the possibility of a threat. Right? Yeah, I think that the students believed that uh, especially um Along certain controversial racial lines, people might wear blackface, they might dress in um, Native American garb in an insensitive way, and that could be highly offensive and highly disturbing and possibly um, cause people to have a really unpleasant, uncomfortable time. And that the idea was that they wanted the administration of the school to step in and say, stop this from happening. This is a place that we want to feel as a community. And if we are, uh, if people are doing things that violate the sense of that community, there should be some sort of punishment for that. Um, and so we want there to be restrictions on what people can wear for Halloween, so that they uh, don't don't make us uh, have an unpleasant, uncomfortable Halloween. Um, and this has, of course, been very divisive. Um, on one side, you have free speech; on the other hand, you have uh, inclusivity, and mm -hmm. both of those are values that Americans have. So I can understand why it is divisive. Um, but it did lead me to think of something, which is when I was in college, I would never have protested that the administration should monitor this. If I thought there was a problem, I would have gone and talked to the people who were wearing the costume and said, "This is a problem; don't do it." Um, or otherwise gotten together with my peers and figured out some solution to this. Um, and it occurred to me that it felt very much similar to what I had been hearing about helicopter parenting, which mm -hmm. is that the administration takes on the role of the parents yeah. and is protecting the students and the students shouldn't have to do that themselves. Um, and that's a long backstory to uh, a simple finding, which is that we ran another version of this where instead of looking at um, helicopter parenting and paternalistic government, we looked at paternalistic uh, teaching. And we asked questions like, to what extent is it the teacher's job to make sure the students do their homework? Yeah. To what extent is it the administration's job to have career support such that that helps students get jobs? To what extent is the uh, teacher or administration's job to prevent students from being exposed to uh, harmful or offensive speech? And what we find is that it's extraordinarily highly correlated as well. It's just as strong, if not stronger, than the political area, um, which suggests to me anyway that there is some hidden variable on that is sort of a free-range versus helicoptering variable um, that persists across many domains, 
We know it persists in teaching, in parenting, and in government. We're currently exploring whether people feel the same way about employers, about religious leaders, about coaches, about other domains, and even about friends. Whose responsibility is it to make sure that, you know, they say friends don't let friends drive drunk yeah. or, you know, those sorts of things. You know, whose responsibility is it? Is it my own or is it authority or is it people in my environment? Um, and I think we're, we're also starting to look, but we don't have much on this, uh, what I call helicopter childrening, um, which is not a thing in the real world as far, I mean, sorry, let's put this, it's not a concept researcher study, but I think it is a thing because I, uh, I'm starting to see uh, parents who are getting older and children using helicoptery type approaches to keeping their parents safe. Wow. Um, uh, as the wow. parents age, as and parents age, and and doing some of those things, I can see that very much. It, it, the the Yale component, it reminded me. I think Jonathan Haidt as the his new book, Coddling of um, the, the American Mind or whatever. Uh -huh. and, and and I haven't read it. I've I've only seen ex excerpts of him, but he's talking about that very component of you know where we are not allowing people that we we expect the administration to step in where. In the past, as you had mentioned, you would have just, it would have been something where you would have gone and said something to that person, or you would have gone and said, got your peers together, and you would have, have, have handled it as opposed to, you know, expecting that parent or that administration or that teacher to do it. And so I, I'm not sure if, if you've done it, read any of his stuff or anything. I mean, I have read one. his work. I have not read that particular book, so I can't really comment yeah. on it. Uh, it sounds like, something that i mean a lot of people are very concerned about this yes issue. um and it is it is certainly a problem when people cannot uh take control of their own well-being mm -hmm. um at the same time the reason that we do have authority figures is to protect us from things so yeah, right, there has to be a balance right. and sometimes the balance is too far on allowing uh, bad things to happen. And sometimes the balance is too far on protecting people and it's not always clear what the optimal level is. Yeah, that and, helicopter submarine, yeah. you know, there's probably, you should just have a car. Just, <laughs> there you <laughs> go, <laughs> just have a car. And I'm th just tell me uh, if this is just way, way off, but I'm thinking of the neurological implications of like the trolley studies. Okay. You know, like is there in the most extreme when it comes to taking action or not taking action of, of, of I can make a change in the world or I'm not going and but I'm not going to do anything about it is is there any it okay the look on your face is just telling me I just completely stepped over the edge so we, we, we <laughs> well I mean I I, uh, I know very little about the neurology behind the trolley problem I am familiar with the trolley problem I'm not quite sure how it relates specifically to this I I think I saw somewhere and I don't know who did it and I may be fabricating this it just may be something that I thought of or you know that um, those are some of the best conversations aren't they? yeah but, but it's uh, when I don't want to say that this is a definite fact even though I think it might be but I uh, I'm not confident enough to say that which so is, is it better than 50% chance that there's a that this is a fact no I would say it's about I mean like it's it's something that I believe I have heard but it's so far out of my area that I can't say if it was just speculation or but let's share it on. anyway but we'll share it anyway, which is that um, given the choice between me acting on the trolley problem or delegating it to someone else, there are probably a lot of people who would prefer to delegate. I don't want to face this trolley problem. It's yes. too hard. Yeah. So if someone else is willing to take on that role instead, uh, that would be something very appealing. And I think it would be very appealing to most people. Um, and so I, I'm not surprised that people want to delegate hard tasks to others. Um, it's because they're hard. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, uncomfortable conversations, I don't want to have them. If I can get someone else to have them in my place, well, why wouldn't I? Well, because you have to have them. And so, you know, um, but I can understand why there would be a push towards delegation. I just, you know, I, but I, that's, that's my only thought about the trolley problem. And again, I know your research on helicopter parenting didn't go into the impact of that, but you can, you can almost make an assumption around if you had a helicopter parent, you may be more likely to want to delegate because you've never had to make some of those hard choices or do some of that component because your parent had always been making those decisions for you. Well, it's one of the concerns that people have about helicopter yeah. parenting is that it makes people dependent. Mm -hmm. And um, if you don't have practice having to do things on your own, then you don't know how to do them on your own. No. Um, you know, there's this notion that failing is, is bad. Mm. 
And um, I understand that. If you fail in high school, you're not getting into the college of your choice. And we have a winner-take-all world, which makes it so that uh, it's very competitive for the best slots, and the best slots are what you need to be able to get employed and successful in all of this, or at least that's the belief. Um, I don't know if it's actually true, but that's what a lot of people are arguing these days. Um, and so, you know, failure becomes something that is unacceptable, but the way we learn is through failure. And um, if you never, you know, the, the, if you try enough, you will fail. And in fact, failure can be a sign that you are doing the right things. You're learning, you're trying new things. And um, when you have people who are afraid to fail because they never have, and they don't know it's so bad, um, it's not, sorry, they don't know it's not so bad, then they might be afraid to take on challenges, which is not good. Well, and I, you give uh, kind of accolades in your class for failures. Is that not one of the things that I read? It, it is, um, yes. In my lab meetings, I have an award for whoever accomplished the most that week, but I also have an award for somebody who failed. Um, and the, the idea is if you're not failing with regularity, then you're not taking on sufficiently difficult challenges. Um, and you can do things that are safe and you can move forward. But if you really want to move forward, you have to take risks. And that means that you have to fail at some point. And um, it, people who are successful, really successful, usually are risk takers. Yeah. And do, so, yeah. Do you see that by giving that award that it creates more uh, more openness for for your students or your you know people in the lab to to take those risks i mean is that have you have you noticed that i mean i know you don't have any research to back it but i, I not only have no research i don't have a contrast effect because i've you've offered, always done and so i don't know what it would be i will say that um when I was a young graduate student, okay, and dinosaurs ruled the earth, um, <laughs> there was this sense that um, I remember my first year thinking, "My gosh, everybody is so accomplished. Everybody is so much better." There's big imposter syndrome. Um, it felt like everything I was doing wasn't working. It was like I didn't know how to do anything right, and everybody else seemed to be, get it right all the time. Um, and that's because they had gone through the same process of failing, but I didn't see it. And even right now, they might be failing, yeah. but I wouldn't see it because no one ever talked about, oh, man, I tried this and it didn't work. What people talked about was, look at this amazing research I had. And that makes sense. You're trying to promote yourself. You're trying to get a job. So you don't talk about all the failures. Um, so I know all my failures were private, but our, you know, all the failures, everybody's failures were <laughs> private. And the successes were public. Right. And it wasn't just other people's, mine as well. I mean, I didn't talk about all the times that I did something and it didn't work or that I did something stupid or whatever. Um, and so I feel like that can be really hard on young graduate students because, uh, and not just young graduate students, I think undergrads too. Um, yeah. Everybody, you know. Well, when people it, in work. I mean, people you, you, work. you, you are starting a new job and yeah. you have that same component. and. <laughs> Even not even starting a new job, you are well into you know your career, yeah. and many people still feel that. And yeah, they feel like they they can't fail because everybody else is always succeeding. And I feel like making it explicit that failure is not just bad but is good. It 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 means that you're doing something right. Uh, authors often talk about collecting failures that you want to have a certain number of rejections because if you don't have that many rejections, that means that you aren't sending an, your your work out enough and you're not. Um, taking on high enough challenges. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I like that notion. And I, I hope that my students, my, fr my first years are more comfortable with the fact that they're failing. They don't feel as much that they are um, the only ones who are struggling. I mean, we're in a field that is hard. If it weren't hard, everyone would be doing it and the problems would all be solved. Right. And so, you know, everybody's going to fail, but a lot of times it doesn't feel that way. And so, giving people the license to fail, I think is, is a, a valuable thing. That's really cool. Um, let's turn the, turn the lens towards history and you've had a, you have a huge body of research. Uh, are there any papers or uh, pursuits findings. that you've made? Yeah. Findings that you feel are underappreciated in, in the past. I mean, yeah, I think every researcher has. I, yeah, well, how could you not, right? right. <laughs> but is there one thing that's like, oh, this was so juicy. This would have changed the world if people would have just. I don't know if I have any papers that would have fundamentally changed the world, but no one paid attention I'm to. I'm sure you did, um, but well. But uh, there, I would say the paper that I am the most proud of that is not cited very much was done with uh, my former graduate student, Anu Shah. It was actually his dissertation work. And okay. it's a paper on um, 
categorization of cues and how that affects people's decision making. So if you um, you can imagine a, a world in which you are uh, trying to figure out which cleaning product is the best and one product works really well on uh, sinks and really well on toilets, but not very well on floors. And you could say, oh, well, it works well on two out of three things. Mm -hmm. Or you could say it works well on porcelain, but not wood, right? So how do you group things that are similar and realize that you're getting the same information from both? It's redundant information. Um, and so another example would be something like, imagine that you uh, interview uh, five witnesses, you're, say you're a military leader and you interview five witnesses who are refugees from a, an event, but you also have satellite imagery. And so all five witnesses say they're massing to attack and the satellite imagery says they're not. So you do have six pieces of information. So do you really have six pieces of information or do you have two pieces of information? The average of the interviews and the satellite imagery. Um, if you think that the interviews are all giving you the same information, counting them five times is going to bias your decision. But if you think they're all giving you different information, then collapsing them is giving the satellite imagery too much weight. And so we were looking at this question of um, how does one determine when cues are redundant and how does one group them? And I, I love that paper. Uh, I, I mean, Anuj did most of the work. Uh, which is probably why I love the paper so much is because <laughs> he did such paper. great work. Um, but it's it's such an elegant paper. It's so thoughtful. And uh, I, I think it really has a lot of um, interesting ramifications, but it really hasn't been made mainstream. A lot of people, very few people know about it, and uh, it's very rarely cited. And I think it actually is one of the more interesting papers that I've written, and I wish it had sort of caught the imagination of the well, people. Well, let's talk a little bit about the implications. Uh, I, I, you know, when you talk about the military situation, wow, I mean, that's that's a big damn problem to solve. You know, and, and misweighting one, uh, one, one of those uh, elements could make a big difference in in the impact of the decisions. Right? Oh, I, absolutely. And it's not just that. I mean, it's um, you can find it in terms of like hiring decisions. You have different pieces of information. A person has a bunch of different grades. Are they all telling you the same thing or are they telling you different things? If she, the person has seven math classes and two writing classes, do we count them all equal? I mean, right now we do. That's how GPA is calculated. Should we? Oh. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions yeah. that we have to decide in terms of hiring, in terms of uh, where to invest our money. So you have different pieces of information coming back on how um, different investment portfolios might look. Um, yeah. Do I want to invest in this company? Well, there are a bunch of pieces of information that may or may not be correlated. Um, and it's even worse now, although this is not what the paper explores. But um, I mean, imagine I talk to both of you and you both seemingly independently give me a piece of information. So I might say, wow, I've heard this from two distinct people. This is really useful information. It's possible, though, that the reason both of you know it is because you talked to somebody during one of your interviews and you heard it from the same source. So, so I'm really only getting one source of information, but I'm double counting it because it, it sounds, sounds like, like it's two. coming from yeah. two. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so this question of trying to identify Q redundancy, it's one that's not like the only we're not the only ones who have looked at it. A lot of people look at this question. Um, but I think it's a really important question. I think we contributed something important to it that just was not picked and, up. And so in that Q redundancy, are, are we not very good at being able to pick up those, the, like when it's redundant and when it's not? Is that some of the findings or how, what, what were some of the implications from, from the paper? So what we were looking at was a particular strategy that people use, okay. which is to group information. And uh, there are times where that's a good thing to do, and there are times where it's probably not a good thing to do. So, so in the case of the five witnesses versus the satellite image, yes, uh, that is is our tendency. My tendency would be to group the five and and say, okay, we've got but we've got five separate points of information, but we're going to group those together versus one satellite image. So I realized I was just nodding in response to your question and nobody can see that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's good. I'm, I'm proud of you for actually acknowledging yeah. that. Uh, well, well done. I'm also <laughs> gesturing up a storm here. The interpretive <laughs> yes. dance I'm doing for my, uh, and it's sad Laugh that the audience doesn't laughter. get to see. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's too um, bad because it's, it's very native. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But the, uh, the answer is yes, people do group. They group spontaneously. Um, and so... In, I mean, I don't know of the specific case of five witnesses right. versus satellites, but the expectation would be that they would tend to cluster those and consider them, weight each of those individual witnesses less powerfully, which is probably the right move, especially if they all came from the same refugee camp, for example. Right. Um, but uh, 
the the question of whether it's a good strategy or a bad strategy is going to be so context dependent. Um, and we never really followed up on trying to identify when is it the best strategy, when is it not, and how close are people to that. Um, well, and going back just to your cleaner example, mm-hmm. right? And you could, yeah, sink, toilet, ver- floor versus you know, porcelain and wood, uh-huh. you can see where, all right, that it, it's going to be context on how you plan on using that that cleaning component, if it's going to group them or not group them. So, right. yeah. and Absolutely. And, you know, a really interesting question becomes when the possible source of redundancy is entirely hidden, like the one I talked to yes. you two about, like, you know, you, you hear from me something about helicopter parenting, you go and tell your next guest something, and they're like, oh my gosh, everybody knows this helicopter parenting deal, um, and it's really just coming from me. That's a problem that I don't know if it's solvable. Because, well, and yeah. I think there could be even in, in today's political landscape, you have to wonder if there, you're hearing various different um, components or viewpoints or or pontifications that are facts, I don't know, whatever you want to call them, that are actually, you, you hear them from a multitude of sources, but they might actually be orchestrated from behind the scenes. And so then mm-hmm. how does that impact how we believe something or not believe something? Well, right. And you can get even worse because people have such terrible source memory. So you see a factoid and it goes back to what I was saying about uh, you know earlier when I was like, I know I've heard this somewhere, but I don't know where I've heard it. <laughs> and it may be just something I came up with. But a lot of times, you know, I, I do a, a search and I get my actual search and then I get a bunch of um, advertisements on yep. the side and I never click on the advertisements, but I do see them. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they say things that may or may not be true. So I'm going to share something that I probably shouldn't because I have no idea if it's true. But I saw today something that said 72% of Americans would never consider voting for a socialist in a recent poll. Um, they said that they wouldn't. Yeah. Could be true, could not be true. I don't know. I didn't click on it because it was a sponsored link. And so, you know, I don't trust the source, but who knows where they but got you're that. you're talking about it right now. But I am. <laughs> and all of your audience just heard that, which may or may not be true, but at least I've told them to take it with a grain of salt. The problem is, is that in four months, they're going to remember they heard it, but they're not going to remember where they heard it from. And and they're not going to remember the caveat to say, take this with a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah. that it is going to be just 72% of Americans right. are somewhere probably even misinterpreting that, but we right. don't elect socialists. 85%. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Just make up numbers at this point. Well, but the crazy thing is, is that imagine that they hear that on this podcast and then they Google search something and they see that same piece of information. They're going to think, Oh, that's a second corroborating source of information. But that's exactly where I got it from. I mean, yes. I've, I've disclosed that. But a lot of times you wouldn't. You would just say, oh, I heard this, and you wouldn't know where it's from. So a lot of these, I think, click on, you know, clickbait things, they're not even expecting people to click. All they're trying to do is get it in their heads that they've seen it somewhere else. And then when they see it a second time or a third time, or someone mentions that they've seen the ad, it feels like it's coming from all these sources. There's all this social proof. And it makes it very hard to know what information we can trust because um, – yeah. Even if we're trying to say, I'm only going to trust things that I see from reliable sources, there's when you get a corroboration of evidence, it starts to seep in. Yeah. I want to go back to Sesame Street and mnemonics. <laughs> and, <laughs> it all comes back to Sesame Street. Well, it comes back to music, actually. Uh, so you use, uh, you, you know, you've used, you do use music in your classes. Uh, so in addition to graduate students not liking to fail, uh, a lot of graduate students come in and they're intimidated by professors. And uh, to me, this is striking because I don't see myself as intimidating. I'm like the opposite, if anything. But, uh, you know, when a professor is there, it's a professor, they have power. Graduate student comes in, wants to impress the professor and can be intimidating. Yeah. Um, and as a, that can be a very intimidating experience. So I try to make it less intimidating by being a goofball and showing my true colors right off the beginning because... Um, when a professor does something really silly repeatedly, it's hard to be intimidated by them. So yeah. I uh, w- had one student who was doing a study that was themed Star Wars. Um, and so I insisted on singing the Star Wars theme song every time the meeting started before I would get an update on the Star Wars project. <laughs> um, wow. And you know what? It, it worked really well. Later, that same student wrote me and said, you know, uh, at first, I was really intimidated, but it was just so hard to take you that seriously and be scared by someone who was doing something so stupid. So, <laughs> you know. So it worked. Well, well done. Yeah. Uh, this comes from uh, what seems to be an apparent love of music, though. You 
You like to sing in the shower. I do like to sing in the shower. I, I like music. I think most people do. I mean, if you look at cross-culturally, there are only very few things that every culture has, and one of them is music. So yeah. I think we're hardwired for that. Um, Thank yeah. goodness, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> there you go. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you this. Do you use playlists to uh, to prime certain things? Do you have a playlist go- getting ready for class? Do you have a playlist for workout? Do you have a you know playlist for uh, now I'm going to sleep? Uh, uh, no, uh, there's, there's, yeah, there's, the answer is no. Uh, the, 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 Again, I'm interpreting for the listeners the facial expressions that I'm yeah. getting. Or. Um, no, I uh, I listen to the radio mostly, um, and I. So you know what we were talking about uh, delegating, yeah, and mm-hmm. I delegate my music. Um, so wow. instead of if I had, to, I, I don't. The nice thing about the radio is they play songs that I would otherwise not know about. Yeah. And so uh, I don't have to worry about um, selecting songs for myself or listening to lots of songs I dislike to try to find the songs that I like. I mean, I still have to listen to songs I dislike on the radio. But things like Pandora, things like the radio, they find the songs that I seem to like. And if there's a station I like, it mostly plays things. And when there's a new song out, I hear it there and I don't have to go seeking it. But you do choose a station. You yeah, I have stations that I uh, I listen to. Um, I I hate. I'm not trying to. No, 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 no. It's just, know, I'm going to say my go strategy for uh, for choosing a station. I hate to say is uh, I want stations that play music in the morning instead of talk. Yes. Um, there's so much talk radio where you have DJs talking about whatever's going on in their lives or making jokes, and it's. It's not what I want to listen to. And so stations that have that, I tend not to listen to. And stations that actually play music in the morning are the ones that I tend to listen to. Well, we had a conversation with Jeff Gallick yesterday, right? And he, we were talking some of the music and the playlist and, and his component of hedonic decline. And, uh-huh. you know, you hear the same song over and over and pretty soon you kind of get sick of it and various different things. And his component with the playlist, which I think comes into a little bit of what you're talking about, just having that station, is the playlist tend to do like on Spotify or Pandora, the same genre and the same genre. And he goes, it would be nice just if they would mix it up a little bit, right? And and add in this, you know, song that's very different and this song that's very different just to mix things up so I don't get so inundated. And I think radio stations tend to do that more than those playlists do. And so I, I applaud you for just listening to radio because I do it at, I have a station at home that, you know, they play Jimi Hendrix and then they go into, you know, a brand new song and then they go and play. It's, it's a pretty know. cool radio station. Yeah. yeah. So that's where I listen and get my, you know, I kind of you say delegate here. You you tell me what I should be listening to. Is it a good strategy? Are you happy with it? Uh, turning over your musical choices to the to the DJs or the corporations that are running the playlists. Corporations, corporations that are running the playlists. You. you know, most of the time there are times where you what, know. Was that cynical? Did I sound cynical? You sounded yeah. cynical. Okay. Yeah. I mean, look, I occasionally will come across something on YouTube, which is some independent artist who's playing a song that I just really love, yeah. and um, and when that happens, I always think to myself. Gosh, why don't I do this more often? And then I start looking for artists that I really love, and oh. I have to listen to a lot of artists that I don't really love to do so. And I realize that's, that's why, why I don't do it <laughs> because uh-huh. because of the amount of time you invest in the songs that and artists yeah. that you don't love. Uh, there's that. Yeah. I mean, like oftentimes I'll hear an artist that I like on the radio, and I'll go look up other songs that they're playing, and they'll play on YouTube, and I'll say, "Oh, that's a really good song. I'm glad I heard it." Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, actually, one thing that's really interesting, and I don't, I feel bad plugging various things here, but that's okay. Um, I've found that there are a lot of people who are taking songs that are play, pop songs on the radio and redoing them in other styles. Yes. So postmodern jukebox is a big name in that space, but they'll take you know a Taylor Swift song and they'll do it in like doo-wop style or they'll you know take a Justin Bieber song and they'll do it in big band jazz from the 20s okay and um I would say nine out of ten times I like the newer version better um the the, the alternative the alternative version style. style um because I think that there is something I mean you I guess Jeff was talking about how similar songs were yeah that I will often be listening to the radio and it used to be I feel like again I'm saying how old I am, but it used to be like during the eighties yeah. that I could hear the first three notes of a song and I would know what song it was. Yeah. There were just fundamental differences between the songs that were being played these days. I, if I listen, especially to a top 40 station, um, it, it can go like almost to the chorus before I can figure out what song it is because they're 
so many of them sound so similar. Um, and I hear that there are algorithms that are being used to try to make them catchy and, and stick in our heads. And, um, and so they do apparently work. I mean, they, they're very popular, but, um, but it is frustrating sometimes that they all sound the same. And when you take those songs that are actually pretty good, but sound the same and you put them in a different style, it makes them really interesting. Yeah. So if it's a good song, it can actually be elevated in your experience to have it played in a different way. I, I have found that to be the case. Yeah, uh, that's, that's very cool. Yeah. Well, good. All right. Well, Danny, thank you so much for being part of this. We appreciate it. You know, we have been uh, this Carnegie Mellon kind of madhouse roadhouse of, of <laughs> interviews we are thoroughly enjoying and we enjoyed this time with you. So. I enjoyed it as well. It was a pleasure chatting with you. And welcome back from London. Thank you. You're good to have you back in the States. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's great to be back in the States, although it's it's 12 degrees outside right now, and um, that I am not so happy about. <laughs> <laughs> Come to Minnesota in January, yeah, that's and right. you'll, you'll appreciate 12 degrees a lot more. That's probably true. Uh, Thank you. Welcome to our grooving session, where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our behavior groups interview, have a free-flowing discussion on some of those topics, and whatever else comes into our little helicopter beanie wearing heads <laughs> I, I i have i just think of bullies and people being bullied bullies what are you talking about the, beanie wi- helicopter hats are the in thing man oh that's going to be hard uh, yes and they there might be something more in than that really <laughs> Do we-, we should have our next photo shoot with you and me wearing <laughs> Behavioral grooves, oh. beanie hats. We could sell them to our listeners who I'm sure would just buy them by the boatloads. It might be the only way we ever make money. Maybe, maybe that's our ticket to yeah, multi million. <laughs> maybe but not. Maybe not. All right. So what did what did you think about our conversation with Danny? What were some things oh. we're gonna groove on? Well, so it was such a great conversation, right? I mean, he's so interesting and he's got such great stuff going. But I wanted to talk about helicopter parenting. Oh yeah. And, uh, of course, I think we have to talk about Q redundancy. Super cool stuff right in there. Um, and then, lastly, I wanted to talk to you about uh, delegating musical choices. Oh, cool. You know, and get your input on how that influences you. Well, thank you for prepping me on that <laughs> musical question that you usually just I'm, throw from left field and I'm floundering. I so know, now I have time I to... to and, to muse on that as I'm it's, talking about the helicopter parenting. It's terribly unfair of me, and I'm, and that's why I wanted to just give you a cue up front. Thank you. So, yeah. so Danny talked about helicopter parenting from the perspective of uh, this relationship between the more helicopter parenting you are, the more it, you're interested in more in, 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 a, in a governance model yeah, a that paternalistic is, yeah. governance model. Fascinating stuff, right? What's even more fascinating is that subsequent to our conversation, maybe not more fascinating, also fascinating. Coincidental. Uh, coincidental to our conversation with Danny in the U.S., there was a big scandal about a this uh, parents who bribed their their way for their kids to get admitted into very <laughs> high uh, uh, esteemed colleges. And there was this big to do and some very high profile audience uh, actresses and other people were were doing this. I, I think what's interesting about this, and we kind of had some conversations about this um, in as we've talked about this actually in relationship to Danny's conversation, is what is the long term impact of that on that student who right. may or may not even know that their right. parents were you know, getting them into this college that maybe they weren't acceptable to. Do those students, uh, you know, adjust to this higher standard or do they fail? An institution like Princeton, they accept, uh, I don't know, a thousand uh, students. But there are, you know, another 200 that are really close to getting in. Yeah. And, and if this student was one of those people, like they're almost there. Like they've already got really good academic abilities or, or athletic abilities, but they weren't just quite enough to be included in that very elite group. So someone like that, you could say, well, they'll probably thrive, right? But what if they're way outside their ability range? Yeah, way outside their comfort zone. So I want to look at this. I think what's interesting is from an organizational perspective. Hiring. 
How well, about that? Uh, hiring, but the, also like once you have new employees in, um, in the U.S., we we have this component sometimes of saying the sink or swim mentality, right? And so, are do you put a, a newer or maybe a more rookie employee in a situation that may be above? kind of that experience and skill set level and just let them, you know, sink or swim, kind of more of a submarine parenting mentality? Or are you more of a snowplow mentality and only give them these opportunities where all the obstacles have been plowed? So you make sure that they have success. And I I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer to that. There probably is. Well, I don't no, but it, it certainly does raise a question of we know that, uh, and Danny mentioned this, we learn from failure. Yes. So having places where we, having opportunities in our life that we take on some challenges and that we fail, we learn from those. And we either build resilience or we find that there's other things that we feel like we're better at, right? We can go other directions. And the manager that snow plows everything might yield short-term successes, but mm-hmm. potential long-term failures, which could be even more devastating, I think. Right. And so, yeah, that that component of saying, hey, learn from your mistakes is probably a good long-term component. It might have some short-term ramifications mm-hmm. from an organizational perspective, which we don't I, – I think there's something to that because we don't like those short-term ramifications. And so we tend to, right, that command and control component of saying – we either have to come in and save this opportunity, this project, whatever it would be, right? As opposed to you know letting that person maybe flounder, have some failure and learn from it. I think about uh, a generation of people graduating from college, uh, starting uh, their business careers. What is the implication on entrepreneurship where I think at least part of what makes an entrepreneur is someone who is willing to fail or has a high resistance to to failure, in part because maybe they've experienced hardship in their own lives. Okay. And they, and they have that resilience. And when I look at the statistics from 2000 uh, to 2015, there's virtually no change in the number of companies with under 20 employees. No. Oh. And yet there's a tremendous growth in the number of people in companies with more than 500 employees. Okay. So people are seem to be flocking to larger organizations and less interested in starting new organizations. So, but... And could could this be related to, I grew up, you know, under a helicopter parent that was kind of watching my way all the time, and now I'm I'm finishing college and I'm going to move into the workforce, and I'm not really interested in trying to I create want a some. I want somebody to replicate that parenting component yes. for me in the corporate world. But on the opposite side of that, you need to start a, a, a new business, right? You have to have some component of not looking at the facts, right? And having an overarching <laughs> yeah. component, right? I mean, the, the SBA says that what? Um, you know, that 30% of new businesses fail for, during the first two years, 50% within the first five years, and 66% within the first 10. So the statistics aren't with you. And yeah, so, yeah. so you've got to deny. <laughs> right. And so having that component of, hey, I've never failed, I'm not one of those people that are going to fail, it would lend itself more likely to maybe starting something. But maybe then they fail more often. So okay. I don't know. More questions than we have answers. Right. Q redundancy. Oh, man, Q redundancy. So I think about the application as a business leader or uh, in in my previous roles as leading product marketing. And uh, what does a business leader do when they have a, a whole, you know, department of people saying, well, you know, uh, this, you know, we believe this and this and this, you know, four, four people in the department say that this, this is the direction that we think we should go. And then we have a, let's say a, a customer survey and it says something totally different. Do you have five pieces of data or do you just aggregate those four employees together and say, really, they're coming from the same place they're, And then there's this, the survey, which is, is opposite to that. I think yeah. the implications are big. I think it's really interesting, and we have an experience that we're working in on a project right now <laughs> yeah, we do. where there is um, 
feedback from teams that aren't necessarily so positive on some aspects of this. And so you're getting complaints from the field uh, in on a certain aspect of this program. But is that feedback from one team who feels slighted mm -hmm. versus the 50 other teams that are just happy with things, but all of a sudden you got five, six, you know, eight people complaining. Is that really one complaint or is it five, six, eight complaints out of this? Well, and there's, and there's also the vividness that goes along with the strength of a complaint is bigger than the vividness of, you know, someone going, Oh yeah, this is going to be great. Yeah. This, and, this and, and, good. and going, this works and, and it's kind of a, it's the non-event that is actually really, you know, important yeah. because, hey, everything went well, so there isn't a complaint. And so on that, does that get more weight in people? And then do you respond and over-respond because those complaints are vivid and there's four of them when really it's one? It's really – because those four people could be from the same team and really their source of disgruntlement is really the same source. It's the same one source. So we're really just getting reporting on one source of disgruntlement, of, of irritation – and and everybody else. So, but do we take it? Does the business leader say, "Well, that's four people who complained," or are we saying that's really one complaint? And it's that squeaky wheel, right? And yeah. so now you have multiple squeaky wheels or one squeaky wheel. And I think there's really big implications from an organization perspective. And I don't know if if leaders really think about it in this way. There, I I don't think that most of the time they're asking the question. What is the source of of this this data point that I'm getting? Right. And these four people are they actually reporting the same data point, the same source, or are they actually bringing separate sources of data points to me? Right. Is it the five refugees and the one satellite image? Is <laughs> right, that right? Is that that, or is it refugee information and satellite information? So now, mm -hmm. when we look at that and say, oh, that's really two data points. That's very different than five data points versus one data point. Yeah, it is. And the way that our brain processes it. And I think for managers to be able to go into those situations, because we, we deal with them all of the time. Yes, we do. To, you know, from marketing decisions to business project decisions to variety of, you know, anytime you get, you know, employee complaints, there's going to be some of this, this aspect taking place. Do we look at the source and do we look and say, is this, you know, redundant or is it not redundant? Is it additive to the information that I'm getting? Right. So I'm just saying all of our listeners who are in managerial positions, or even if you're not, take that into account when you're looking. When Please you're, do. Yeah. Please do. Okay. So Kurt. Oh, Danny, yeah, come on. Now I, I, I have to remember, what did you no, ask me? No. Right. So, so uh, Danny says he delegates his musical uh, choices that he very rarely curate, uh, curates a list, right? He, he'll go to uh, Pandora or, or the, just the radio or some service. He'll choose a station. Right. And so sort of I, I'm interested in listening to music within this genre, but he's letting the curators of those lists bring him whatever music they, they tee up. Yeah. Uh, you, I know, I know a little bit about your music habits. You've talked to me enough. You, you listen to the radio, but you also have curated lists. Tell me about the difference. So, I listen to the radio mostly in the car, and so and, it, and it's, it's music. It's radio. music radio. I listen to NPR and other things as well, but I, yeah. I will listen to music in the car, and I often find that that music. I, I, I'm searching sometimes for familiar, but oftentimes I'm also listening for new and and what what is something that catches my again to some of the earlier conversations uh, you know that we had with Jeff in regards to what's that thing that catches my hedonic attention and is snappy and really cool. Yeah. Um, and so I look for that. But the other listening that I do is mostly curated. So it is this component of hmm. your, uh, your own on, lists. On, if it's not a, a list, it is a a station that I have made on Pandora, oh, which is okay. a certain artist, and then Pandora allows you then to add variety to that. And okay. so, for instance, um, my Angus and Julia Stone radio station, I have I have 
also added in for some others, some things like Damien Rice is is a counterpoint to that. Um, Dan Wilson is is listed as these elements that that change up. So it isn't just this Angus and Julia Stone. It is this combination of Angus and Julia Stone along with others. But I do do I do do I do use the radio. <laughs> As a a point of finding new music, and like recently, I just came across Flora Cash, um, who I'd heard some of their, uh, I'd heard a couple of their songs, hadn't really put that it was Flora. The one thing about radio that I don't like is that I hear a song I like, but I'm in the car and I can't really oh, research yes. who who is yeah. this, and they don't necessarily say. And then I leave the car and I forget about it. Long story, um, but I, I I heard Flora Cash on an interview, and then they they did in studio songs, and I was just blown away. And so now, for the past three weeks, that's what I have been I have been just listening to Flora Cash and put them on Pandora, and I get their top songs, and wow. I'm you wow. know just getting into them. I'm going to a concert at the end of the con- at the end of the month with Flora Cash. So wow. all because I heard them on the radio. There you go. Long-winded answer for I a very that. short question. No. What about you? Do you listen to the radio? Do you curate more? What What's your? I go I go through periods where I focus on radio, and I go through periods where I'm I'm curating my list pretty highly. Yeah. When I'm getting ready to, uh, if I'm in a writing mode, uh, I just want new stimulation. So if I'm writing new material, then just bring me the radio and see what happens. Uh, but if I'm producing a record, then I want specific sounds. Then I want to curate what I'm listening to to orient my head around sort of what the production value of that record's going to be like. You're very purposeful on I, this. I'm a pretty intentional guy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I'll leave that as. Oh, I'll leave no. that. I won't even go there. I will not go there. All right. Well, with that, thank you, listeners. Um, hopefully, this conversation with Danny Oppenheimer was just uh, insightful for you. It was very fun for us. He's just a fascinating gentleman, and I would encourage you to to, to look up some of his research. And if you've got insights on uh, on this use of uh, cue redundancy in your work life, oh, share it with us. We'd, please. We'd love to hear about that. Yeah, we'd love to have that conversation. So with that, keep, keep on, on grooving. grooving.